Hello and welcome to this very special episode. Today I'm joined by Michael Shacklock to talk all about neurodynamics and neural pain disorders. Michael is a physiotherapist with over 35 years of experience. He has published an international bestseller textbook titled Clinical Neurodynamics. He's also published two other textbooks relating to pain and the nervous system, plus numerous research publications. Michael is an international leader in the diagnosis and treatment of musculoskeletal and neural pain disorders. He is also the principal and director of Neurodynamic Solutions. So it is a real honor to have a chat with Michael today. So let's dive into the episode. All right. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll dive straight into it. Uh, thank you again, Michael, so much for, for joining me. Uh, today we're going to be chatting all about neurodynamics. So I guess we can kick this off, Michael, by asking what are neurodynamics? Well, you know, it's a good question because there's a lot of mis- the misconceptions, misunderstandings, um, and that's because it's quite a broad term. It relates to everything from molecules up to the mechanical behaviour of the nervous system or movement of the nervous system. And if you even go to some of the earlier uh, descriptions of it, uh, you can even go to psychiatry and talk about how personalities develop, and, and that's sometimes considered in medical circles neurodynamics. So I had to define it, um, otherwise it was going to be misunderstood. And I defined it in the physical health sciences as mechanics and physiology of the nervous system as they relate to each other, because they're dynamically interdependent. So if we put a force on the nervous system, it changes the physiology. If we have abnormal physiology, it can change the physical behaviour of the nervous system as well. So I've put them together as part of a spectrum of interactive mechanisms. Now, that's just the theory or the construct. For me, the next step is, that's all very well, but what about how we apply the subject, particularly to our patients, because I believe science should provide benefit to the community. Uh, and so that's a clinical, a clinically applied technique, and I call that clinical neurodynamics. Now, the next part is that there are misconceptions in that. A lot of people think that neurodynamics or clinical neurodynamics is neural mobilisation. And I'm saying no. They are integrated, or can be, but they're not the same thing. It's like saying, I'm a cat, therefore I'm an animal, therefore all animals are cats. No. There's a what's there's interaction, but they're not the same thing. So for me, clinical neurodynamics is diagnosis and treatment of functional disturbances in the nervous system, mechanically particularly, and part of the treatment for that might be neural mobilization, but it doesn't have to be. Ah, that's very interesting, isn't it? When we when we put that into under that um, umbrella of neurodynamics, and there's there's different aspects to that. That's fantastic. And, and so I guess, um, as you said, the, the uh, evolution of neurodynamics and the understanding of, of what we're doing, I mean, it, it used to be called ne- uh, neural tension tests and neural stretches. Well, why have we sort of moved away from, from that? That's another good question. You, you've been reading the subject quite well, obviously. Excellent. <laughs> um, it did used to be called neural tension because in, it, in, it, in its earliest form, it was used as a tension manoeuvre and was understood that way. The earliest description of a neurodynamic test was 4,800 years ago, believe it or not, and it's not, not much happened until about the 1880s when medical physicians in Europe were thinking of uh, mechanical behaviour of nerves and, and so they'd show the stuff in cadavers and so forth. Um, and then the treatments for them were stretching, nerve stretching for, for those problems and they applied them inappropriately, but they applied them for medical diseases such as diabetes and so forth, and it was obviously incorrect. Then came through David Butler and Louis Gifford's first publication on the subject uh, that I know of in in 1991, I think, 1989, um, and that was where it's described as uh, adverse, the concept of adverse mechanical tension, tension in the nervous system, which then outlines some of the principles of diagnosis and treatment, which is great. And just before then, um, Elf Breed, which is sweet, who was a Swedish neurosurgeon, wrote a, 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 a formative book called Ad, the, um, Adverse Mechanical Tension in the Central Nervous System. Um, and that's where he, he looked at the subject from the, the cellular level right up to the patient level, anatomical and biomechanical, even created photoelastic models of force behaviour in the nervous system. 
And um, he put forth the idea of tension being a, a, a provocateur, if you will, mm-hmm. of, of all this problem. Now, if we get to the fine analysis, he was probably right because um, if we think of, say, dyskinia, um, it, the, the neural tissues have to pass a longer course over that dyskinia, so the nervous system is actually tighter. So compression actually gravitates to tension on a fine level. And the same as pressing on anything or cutting food. The, the blade separates the, the, the cells or the molecules, which is actually a tension mechanism. And, and so even though we have compressive problems as the most common, they do actually gravitate at a fine level to tension. And so that's the kind of basis for uh, the, the idea that tension was a key issue. Um, and I, I feel it was based on Alfred's work where, where he was trying to create a general theory of symptom production with new problems, and, and that probably is tension at a fine level. But unfortunately, we don't operate always at that fine level. We operate on the movement, diagnosis, and treatment level. So we deal with movement-related nerve pain. Some of it can be tension at that level of analysis. Some of it can be compression and so forth or movement. Yeah, so that's, that, that's my understanding of the origin of tension. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting as well when we, we look at just the words and the, the narrative behind that and the perception from a patient point of view, you know, if it's tension, maybe I need to stretch it or, you know, and a lot of the, the interventions may be targeted at if, if you've got pain, stretch it or press it. And that adds further tension and compression to a sensitized nervous system. Yes, exactly. Now, uh, and, and that sort of gave it. For, for, I sort of feel like I'm the, the the middle ground here, or the the conduit between the two extremes of the spectrum. One is uh, physiology, it's all chemistry sensitivity. Another part is um, mechanical, the uh, compression, loss of movement, and so forth. But I feel that they're interdependent. We should be focusing on the relationships between the two, not not just one or one or the other. And, and I don't know about your discipline, but in physiotherapy, we're a big move to sensitivity. Um, it's all about sensitivity. It's all general. Don't worry about it. You can't treat it specifically. You can't do a di- specific diagnosis. So don't worry. Be happy. Move. That's the solution. Now, that is actually true for some people. But uh, the other people who need something that's highly specific. And what we have in the specificity is the clinical. So if you had someone with a sliding dysfunction at lum- with a lumbar radicular problem, mm-hmm. that shows itself with movement-related pain very differently from a tension dysfunction. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so what we have is specificity with movement-related nerve pain as opposed to just mechanical sensitivity because that gravi- that can come from compression or irritation or of other problems. So the mechanical sensitivity is a physiology, but it doesn't give us specifics for diagnosis and treatment of movement problems. It's the gravitate, what everything often gravitates to, but the causes and triggers are often movement-related and quite specific mechanically. Yeah, okay. And so is that where we see the role of, of say, a neurodynamic slider versus a tensioner in, in the treatment exactly. intervention? Exactly, yes. And so if you have someone who has pain with movement and it's quite severe, my feeling is that one of the most useful movement techniques or even manual technique is a flossing technique, movement slider. Uh, let's do some flosses. That can help pain, of course, because it does not produce much force in the nerves. It slides them. So if you look at the tension behaviour in the nerve, which is the most provocative movement, they don't actually change tension much. So that's why they're so safe. And, and, and movement, motion is motion. And so um, the non-specific part is the sliding. Very useful in certain cases. And it's very safe. It doesn't provoke many people. But on the, on the, the other end of the spectrum, there's a mechanical dislike, impairment sometimes, and that's where we might focus on, on the tension or the physical aspects of nerve dysfunction. Yeah, okay. And so if we put that into context, well, why couldn't I just move them? Why couldn't I just exercise as opposed to the specificity of, of say, a, 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 a flossing technique? Yeah, good. Okay, so Friday afternoon surprise. Okay, you're a clinician, you're, you've had an exhausting week, you're absolutely tired, and patient is talking to you and you say, you know, I've got to finish today. I've got to get home. You know, I've got family. And you have the last few minutes and you think, gee, I haven't done anything. I'm running late. And, uh, you know, a great thing to do is flossing. But you do the slump test on them and um, you see that when they bring their head down, it provokes their back pain. 
But when they straighten their knee, you're thinking, hmm, you're on tension. They say to you, oh, that feels better. So knee extension, which increases tension, makes them feel better. Now, that does not make sense for a tension problem. Okay. And that's why I call it the Friday afternoon surprise. It's when you hate surprises, last patient, and oh gosh, and this is complicated. I really have to solve this. And so uh, you're the one with the headache and you've got to leave, but you have to solve the problem because it's, you know, it's conflicting with time and management and the diagnostic expectation that we have. So that is not a neural tension problem. That is a sliding dysfunction. And if you do a sliding or tension protocol according to the usual, pro- usual protocols, it's the wrong treatment mechanically. Okay. And, and, and so that's where the mechanical specificity comes in. And in some people, I've put them through sliding protocols and advance them too quickly, and they get worse. You put them in a tension protocol, doesn't match their problem. So the specificity, again, to some, for some people, I believe is important. Yeah, fantastic. And and in your book, it's a fantastic book. Um, it, so this is sort of where you talk along the lines of make, like opening and closing type mm-hmm. dysfunctions. Is that is that correct? Yes, exactly. Now, um, if we think of the most common cause of neural problems in the musculoskeletal area, it's compression. Lumbar radiculopathy is due to compression, some with cervical, some with carpal tunnel syndrome, and so forth. It's not the only cause, but it is one of the most common. Um, what we have to do with clinical neurodynamics is connect movement-related problems or musculoskeletal problems in the interface around the system so that we can connect them to their movement-related nerve pain. Now, the early line of reasoning was musculoskeletal was causing the nerve problem, true, so we'll treat musculoskeletal and the nerve problem should also improve. But unfortunately, there's a group of patients where that does not happen. And what we then have to do is integrate the behaviour of their system in relation to the nerve, their musculoskeletal system in relation to nerves, so that we can then integrate their movement dysfunction and nerve dysfunction. So if you're talking about someone with a closing problem, I'm thinking lumbar thing because it's a common area, extension and ipsilateral lateral flexion will provoke the distal pain. So, so if thinking neurodynamically, that's a foramen closing technique. doesn't really test sliding or tension behaviour in the nerve, it tests the behaviour of the interface and movement in relation to each other. So that patient has severe pain with compression, we might do an opening technique to transiently unload that nerve root to give them pain relief. So that starts to integrate movement diagnosis with nerve pain, and that must include musculoskeletal. So from a clinical neurodynamics is the integration of all those things, including in this case. It's not That's just nerve flossing. And that's fantastic. It really emphasizes the importance of specificity with our assessment because it, it, it's it's clear that uh, if we choose that the wrong intervention, whether it is you know a, a tension versus a, a slider that that's applied, that could potentially be provocative or, or not lead to more favorable outcomes. So um, that's that's fantastic. Um, okay, so from from a in a clinical context, where do people start? You know, when we when we look at neurodynamic as- assessment and then sort of integrating that into treatment. We, there's often questions around, well, how many do we do? How long do we do it for? How many times per day and per week? Like, what's w- How do you sort of identify what the appropriate dosage might be for the individual in front of you? Yeah, that, yeah that's one of the most important clinical questions, isn't it? You know, I was just online just before this doing a telehealth session with a medical doctor who's got a neuro- neurodynamic problem, and um, he was he asked a similar question. And because um, he's been given flossing techniques and it really hadn't produced much improvement, and looking at him, he could actually move quite well. He only had a small limitation in his slump test. Now, that's a, in people who have intermittent pain, it's not easily provoked. They, they kind of move quite well. Flossing isn't really suited to that patient because it doesn't get at the mechanical problem well enough. Okay. It's too low a dose. And so we up to the dose and could really then reproduce his pain and so forth. Now, the, the analogy I made with the doctor was, you, you know about diabetes. That's, your, it's, you, that's a disease you guys manage very closely. He said, oh, yes, of course, that's right. So, and I said, if you give a too low an insulin dose, you won't help the patient. If you give too high a dose, you can put them into a coma. Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, yeah, that's right. And I said, that's the importance of dose. 
um, if you underdose them, there's no effect, and the error could be neural mobilisation doesn't work. But if you get the right dose, you're applying the right force on the patient, uh, then you might get a better effect. And that is like manually, myofascial release. If you just touch and fiddle and just wipe your hand over the skin, that may do nothing. But if you push hard enough, you can sometimes get at the physical problem and often produce, or we think produce better response in certain people. So the dose and the truth about neural mobilisation is we have no idea what the best dose is. We, we, we really don't know whether people respond better to five movements or 10 or 50. We don't know if they respond better to end range versus sliding or flossing. Um, there's been almost no research on what dose is best for certain problems. And, and so, the tr again, we don't really know. But um, so we, we have two things. The first is biology. We know certain things about what nerves do when you do things to them. Um, and the second is how does a patient respond? And they're quite separated. I can't yet connect them because we don't have enough knowledge. And so if we go to the biology, we know it's, to me this is fascinating. There's a, there's a study that shows that when a nerve gets inflamed, you get muscle wasting. And, and the idea is that it's, it's because of a neurological deficit that the nerve can get impaired. But what they found was the muscle wasting was directly related to how much trophic factor the nerve secretes into the muscle when it's inflamed, and that trophic factor tells the muscle to get wasted. Right. So it's not just loss of function and atrophy from inactivity. It's actually it's an active mechanism that tells it to get wasted. Now, this is the the, the, the reason I'm talking about this is that it, you know, there are other mechanisms mechanisms that we can expect, but also. They did neural mobilisation to different doses to see the effect. And the, the first effect was, the first dose was 6% elongation, which is if you've got a 10 centimetre nerve, it goes a 6 millimetre longer, and then re reverse it and, and, and repeat it. And they found there was very little change in anything, blood flow, secretion, trophic factor, and muscle wasting. They went to 12%, and that produced a, a drop in blood flow during the technique of the end of the movement. And then after it was there was a small hyperemia and then a slight improvement in the muscle wasting. And the traffic factor also changed a little. What was really interesting, in between those two values, 9% produced the biggest response by a long run. So it was not a graded response with dose, meaning the more you do, the better. It was that the specific dose was required. Too much didn't do much. Too little didn't do much. The nine percent produce a big improvement. That Goldilocks principle. <laughs> yeah, it's it, for me. It was it blew my mind and it made me realise that there is a dose in there. We just don't yet know what elongation we're producing in certain people and what their requirements are and so forth. But from a research perspective, that's biology. But but then we're left with the second part, which is patient response. If they are provoked severely and it doesn't improve me you know, soon after, then we have to say that patient is not a candidate for that technique. It's just not ethical to put people into painful situations and even if they don't improve and carry on treating them. So, and, and that's kind of what most health physical health practitioners would do. Do something, and if it produces worsening results, then you stop. It's not quite, quite easy and logical. Um, so patient response on that part eliminates them. But then conversely, if they improve progressively during the treatment or with repeated treatments such as home exercise and so forth, then we would continue that treatment. So unfortunately, we're still left with observation and measurement of patient response. But that's just the way it is at the moment. Later, with more technology, we think we'll now be able to measure strain in nerves as we move with ultrasound and so forth. But it's still not, it's, it's lab techniques, it's not available clinically. So the summary point is we don't really know the best dose, but patient response is the critical element. Okay. So if we're looking at someone with lumbar radicular pain, for example, um, and we know there's probably a, a prognosis of a minimum of three months. Uh, in that time frame, when we're looking at nerve mechanosensitivity and irritability of their nervous system, is are we just looking for that that gradual change over time? Obviously, we, we can't necessarily expect significant changes very early on. So, I guess my question is: it, it how do we uh, gauge the level of irritability? The, the severity, um, 
and I guess the symptom behavior of the, the patient to see if it's worthwhile continuing with neurodynamic mobilization or if we need to take a, a different course? Uh, for me, um, patient response is obviously critical, and it, but, but part of the clinical reasoning approach, which I think should be applied to all, all clinical practice, um, is that we weigh up factors that go for and against the patient's outcome. And um, things that go for a patient would be general health considerations and lifestyle. You know, don't drink too much, don't smoke. That's the two big ones. Um, if you, you know, alcoholism is a disaster for the immune system. Um, and, and so that's that, that, that's on one side of things, and it might be nutritional status, it might be activity levels. So that this, does someone exercise regularly? Have they generally got a healthy spine around that lumbar problem? Um, and if they have, they got reasonable mobility. Are they not too overweight? Are they not pre-diabetic? These are, these are sorts of things that we we might consider. But locally, um, we still have to consider those variables. And so, if someone has a a bunch of prognostic factors that go against them, then I might say we're well, going to have to persist with this treatment a bit longer to produce the change that we want. Um, or if someone's well, you might expect a better outcome. However, one of the prognostic Bad things, I would say, is size or severe of the severity of the pathology. Now, I know that there's a lot of discussion these days about pathology and symptomatology not really connecting very closely. That is true for certain things, but unfortunately, more recent research is connecting physical problems better than they used to because they're considering more variables. And, and one of the, the key variables is lumbar instability in the presence of dyskinesia. Mm -hmm. We know that dyskinesia is done to us first. But when you get lumbar instability at the same time as a dyskinesia, you, it's a, it's, you are much more likely to have low back pain. And, and so um, someone, if I had saw so this, this fellow I saw an hour ago, he did have symptoms of so, a minor lumbar instability um, and he had dyskinesia with ridiculous problems. Now, my feeling is for him, he needs to control his force load, do load management force control, movement control, to protect his nerve root and his disc, that, then that might put him in the context of nerve movements responding better and producing a better result than if he's how lumbar pelvic is just flapping in the breeze. And, and so prognosis expected outcome, I weigh up factors and say what goes for and against. I personally don't like to say to patients, you're never going to get better or this is going to fix you because it's much more complex than that. And mostly the people who say this on particular social media, either they're deleting themselves or trying to delete someone else. Uh, I'm quite critical of some social media things. Some of it's really good. It's a great opportunity. But we do really we do have a lot of false information out there. And unfortunately, we as health practitioners to be getting there to get better at figuring out what's true and what's not. But the prognostic factor is how I would relate to expected response. And that's what goes for and against the patient. Pathology, big pathology is actually quite bad, even though there's discussion about not relating. Um, since big dyskinesias have been shown, this is really interesting, um, there's, a, there's a couple of studies that show in people with lumbar, pro, lumbar nerve root problems, um, if they had the same general clinical features, like that pain, sciatica and so forth, if they measure the pressure in the foramen, those who have a contralateral shift have double the pressure than those who don't. Okay. And that's pretty pretty convincing. Um, and those who have neurological deficit have approximately four times the pressure of those who don't. And those who have quarter equina problems have approximately six times the pressure. Wow. And and this so my point here is that if you're talking about neurological and neurodynamics, size of pathology might matter. Okay. And so yeah, that's really interesting when we also think about the size of pathology, the amount of compression, the, potentially the inflammatory component, which can lead to, to increased levels of sensitization. Um, so I guess from a, a clinical point of view, how do we uh, explain this to our patients uh, mm. to get buy-in? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a really good one. You know, I was over at the World Neurodynamics Congress in Dallas a few months ago, and um, Jeff Bogue, who's one of my favourite neuroscientists, was there. Luckily, he was there and giving a fantastic lecture. It was David Seaman as well. He's very deflame and he's very nutrition. Fantastic people. And there was a, there was quite an intense debate between the clinicians and the scientists. And um, the 
clinician's um, position was, look, we've got to explain this stuff to patients. Mm. You know, if you use um, nociceptor sensitization, you lose them in the first sentence. And, and one of the most important parts of our patient outcomes is engagement, and you've got to connect with the patient. And so language becomes important from the different layers of knowledge. And for me, science we actually creates a lot of the language which we kind of have to use because we need to connect with scientists accurately, but we also have the obligation of communicating accurately to patients who know nothing about science in certain cases. And so what, I don't know about you, but and other clinicians, but I actually sit down about time off a goal, have a glass of wine, and, and I'll write down the layers of, of knowledge that we have to get to patients, but I'll try and structure my language differently for different layers, but still create the, the, the accurate meaning. It's a hard thing to do, actually. I don't know about you, but I find that difficult. And, and so one of the things that David said to me, he said, Michael, you guys have got to get away from mechanics. You've got to start using the word movement. So I've actually good point. So what we can do with patients with neurodynamic problem is say, we now know that the movement behaviour, the movement of your nerves changes when you get this problem, and we, we can help you move off or on your nerve to make it feel better. So when you're standing, you've got this discount in your hyperlordotic when you're bouncing back, that's actually pressing on your nerve. Um, and we can help you stand or move without pressing on your nerve. This is what we can do to help you. Okay. So, so, so that's kind of reasonably simple. It's kind of lay terminology. Most people understand move movement. Most people understand pressure. And my, most people understand the word help and move better. Yeah. And, and so, it's... Sorry, go on. Sorry, go on. Oh, and so for me, I've, I've actually had to stop, think, and so how do I explain this mechanism through different layers of knowledge into what a patient might understand? And that's really important. But I've, personally, I find that difficult. Yeah, it's a real challenge, isn't it? Because if the patient perceives that to say, well, I've got something pressing on my nerve, if I move, that will press it even more. And then I could potentially have worse symptoms and potentially not be able mm -hmm. to walk. Yes, exactly. And unfortunately, we have this conflict between the language we use telling the truth and scaring the patient. Um, and the good one is radiology, isn't it? We are not supposed to scare the patient and send them to radiology. But unfortunately, I think that's biased. I think we have to uh, understand it better and use it more skillfully because there's a recent study where they looked at people who had chronic low back pain and just said, just tell us of your concerns. Let's do an open-ended discursive paper and just ask about what people are concerned about. And many of them said, we're not going to do rehab because we haven't been investigated. We don't know what it is and it could be really serious. So mm -hmm. we haven't been reassured that there's nothing serious. So whilst that's not yet eliminated, we're not going to engage in rehab. So they created, they had fear from not knowing. Okay. And so what we could do is say, look, rather than the radio waves producing a problem, which they don't, it's not the radiology, it's how we use it. And, and so for me, if someone has radiology, I don't actually go straight to pathology and disease, don't matter, don't worry about radiology, because that's dismissive and then disengages. That's not good for therapeutic relationship. And so I would say, oh, radiology, let's have a look. What do you think? Say to the patient, what do you think? And they go, oh, disc hernia, this is really bad. When I bend over, it's going to break the disc. Then you know they're, they're avoiding. But if they say, actually, I'm not really worried about the disc. I'm just worried about when I move my back. It hurts. That kind of is a better zone to be in because then we can get them into moving better. But So, so this sort of somatization, explaining pathologies is controversial, but if we polarise it at one end, which is don't tell them about it, we've got to be careful because our professional responsibility is to tell the truth. And if we obfuscate or hide stuff from the patient, they will find it because there's jet GPT, there's Google out there, and if they sense we're not telling the truth or giving them the whole truth, that is bad for the therapeutic relationship. And so if we if we are polarised, I sort of feel like we, we corner ourselves and reduce our choice and our patient's choice. So for me, I do include the pathology and disease, but I try and word it in a way that's healthy for them. 
Okay, so do you, you see the role of imaging and nerve conduction studies in in the early phases of of assessment and treatment? Do you see that that has has a role? Uh, look, not not always. I was, the one thing for me is, do they have a neurological deficit? Uh -huh. If they don't, then it's much less important. If they do, then I'm I'm really careful about. Well, if we say to these people, look, and they say, I've got my foot's not moving the way it should. It's weak. I go, oh gosh. This is, I don't like this because then you have to decide to get radiology or other other medical interventions, etc. Um, unfortunately, people who have, say, a foot drop early in the radiculopathy, about 20% of them are still not better after a year. So if we head them into don't worry, be happy, move, don't look into what the problem is, we could be putting them into a chronic neurological deficit situation. We might be depriving them of potentially effective treatment. And so I'm not, I, I don't swing either way strongly, but for me, if they have a, my rule if clinically is they, if they have a severe, progressive or extensive neurological deficit, I certainly don't tell them not to get investigated. Okay. I, I, I want to know why it's there, and, and often that needs medical evaluation, and I'm not averse to it. But if they have that just uh, innocuous type pain problems, that don't indicate anything serious or severe, and they're not progressive, and they're not losing, not bad at night, and all these other things. They got movement-related pain. Then I'm not so concerned about radiology. Okay, so the importance there is is looking for a neurological deficit, either sensory and or motor. So yeah. conducting a full neurological screen, and then I guess the the, the role then of neurodynamics is looking for movement-related dysfunctions once we've ruled out serious pathology. Yes, absolutely. Well put. Fantastic. Okay. And so in those those patients then that they may not see anything on, on imaging um, and they may not have a neurological deficit, um, but they've got severe pain. Mm -hmm. What are we what are we looking at there? What's That's the reason for that? People often equate severity of pain with seriousness of the problem. And that's where they get scared. And fair enough, I mean, you don't know about these things. You would get scared. Um, and so somewhere along the line, I'll try and meet them where they are and, and, and say, look, the severity of your pain doesn't mean life threatening. You know, in people who have, well, I'm going to say this to the patient, but I'm thinking people who have a buildup of terminal cancer, they often do get severe pain late, and it's horrible, just awful. And so for them, the progression of disease does relate to their severity of pain. Um, that's a medical issue. Fortunately, I'm glad I don't have to deal with that difficult problem. But um, uh, but when it comes to severe musculoskeletal pain, I think it has to be related to clinical context. Now, if someone has a car accident, severe neck pain with neurological symptoms, and they're older, that's uh, that's part of the clinic. That's kind of a spiral, and I would refer them for radiology. It will refer them to a medical practitioner for that option. But if someone has a small injury, they've got a bit of achy, breaking neck pain, no neurological problem, then it's much less important. And I would then say, oh, look, remember, severity of pain doesn't mean you've broken your neck. You know, I don't know about you, but I hurt like heck when I get a bee sting. But I'm not allergic to it, thankfully. It's a pain really sore, but it doesn't mean I'm going to die, and it doesn't mean there's a really serious health issue. So what we need to do with you is find out why your pain is so severe, and we're going to do that safely and so forth with these other things. Are you okay with that? So it's kind of negotiative and informative. Okay, great. And and I, I know that there's a a, a a lot of structure to to a screening process. Um, but from a neurodynamic point of view, do you think that it's possible for us to localize the area of of mechanical dysfunction or nerve sensitization? Yeah, I think you can sometimes. Um, uh, for instance, if someone has radiating pain, let's say from the shoulder down to their hand, now that could be neck or, or brachial plexus, obviously. Um, and I would certainly do sparing's maneuver. I would check the neck, and if that looks really good, um, and a neuro say they don't have a neurological problem, there's no deficit, and you're thinking, well, where is this pain coming from? Um, then I would do the neurodynamic test, uplimited me, me number one. But unfortunately, that doesn't tell you where the problems are coming from because it's a long pathway and you're testing a number of things at once. So um, uh, my feeling is that you, you have to test the system along its course and interface. Spurling's maneuver for neck or Kemp's maneuver for lumbar spinal would use. Um, I'd palpate the neck. Um, dare I say, palpate. Well, 
Uh, and so I would palpate the neck to find out if I can reproduce these symptoms with soft tissue or joint techniques and so forth. But I would also go along to the shoulder or palpate the brachial plexus in the shoulder area um, and see if I could reproduce distal symptoms. I mean, you can go further down to elbow and wrist. Um, so, you know, it's kind of strange because actually, if we're thinking of peripheral nerves, um, my favourite technique for, for localising where the problem would be is palpation. Now, having said that, I'm, there's a lot of discussion and papers about how uh, palpation is not very accurate in certain situations, but there's a study by an Schmitz group that showed nerve palpation for responses was very accurate and very reliable. Mm. Um, and so uh, maybe palpation of nerves is a bit easier, I don't know. Um, now, that's not doesn't mean you and I are reliable, but it means that at least that there's potential for us to be reliable. And um, it just clinically, you can eliminate stuff really well just by pressing it firmly on it, feeling it all, and making sure you don't reproduce pain, as long as you're anatomically correct. Um, you know, and Alison Grimaldi's kind of shown that if you palpate the greater trochanter quite firmly, and it's perfectly okay, that's pretty good for eliminating pathology in that area. So I don't always use palpation to, to include, I use it to eliminate. And that's really useful. Yeah. Okay. And so for that that example, differentiating, say, a cervical radiculopathy from uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, for example, that nerve palpation could complement a lot of those other tests as a as a useful cluster together. Exactly. Clustering is the key. You're quite right. Uh, and so you're balancing um, pieces of evidence. You know, and, you know, if you go to Sackett's original definition of you know, evidence-based practice, patient-derived features can be a form of evidence. And, 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 you know, to me, that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And so we know that uh, movement is is fantastic uh, and, and neurodynamics is, is a fantastic way to, um, to integrate movement from a passive through to active approach. Uh, are there any other manual therapy-based techniques that, that you, you would support or use in clinical practice? Oh, gosh, I'm pretty open-minded. Um, I, I actually think um, I, I'm not too just uh, too – I don't distinguish too much between approaches. Um, and I would say that neuromobilisation or neurodynamics is just one of the many approaches that could be used, and I wouldn't say that it distinguishes itself as being more effective than any others. Um, so uh, for me, there's kind of divisions like the science – Procedure within the reasoning, and then finds the, the creative or the skillful part, which is the artistic part. Um, and for me, you know, you, you can look at someone and think, "Gee, because you know, I still don't understand how to fix, how to how to connect with this problem. I've tested it every which way." So the patient, look, you tell me that this this unusual position while you're performing art is a dancer. This is an unusual position that reproduces your pain and it's sort of holding you back during performance. I can't, you know, I've tested all the parts. But I can't reproduce your pain. Can you do it? And they go, oh, yeah, easy, just like this. And I get into the aware position and say, that's it. Beautiful. That is the creative part that we can then dive in with our hands and do stuff in that very position. And, and so they're creating the situation. We're getting the specifics from there. And, and so for me, um, you can't get away from this artistic part if you really want to find out what certain patients need. So there's the, the hands-on part. There's any. I'm willing to apply any approach. It could be my facial work. It could be maintenance, which I've learned. I've learned a bit of Carlton Bourne. You could do McKenzie. You know, Mulligan. For me, the, I don't really distinguish approaches. It's about how to understand the mechanisms, the clinical features, testing, treatment, and many approaches will do this. And I don't see them as being conflict. Yeah, that's great. And I think the importance as well is is understanding that mechanical interface, understanding the prime demands and, and the meaningful movements for that patient and and how do we integrate that um into their into their overall management. Yeah, exactly. And meaningful is the key, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, and so I, I won't keep you for, for too much longer, but uh, I mean, I could talk to you all day about this sort of stuff. But um, let's say that there is some peripheral nerve sensitization um, and, and you know how that leads into those long-term changes. Are we, are we seeing both um, mechanical changes that occur in, in the, the peripheral nervous system as well as central changes that are also occurring with persistent pain? Mm. Oh, okay. When you say persistent pain, do you mean chronic, the, 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 the chronic pain problem? Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Um, my feeling is that um, I wouldn't rate nerve problems more more highly than any other type of problem in, in a situation of chronic pain, except um, it's a case of treat what you find. Now, some people are going to have a long term problem, which might be might relate to peripheral neuropathy. It might relate to say supernatal tunnel syndrome or piriform syndrome or chronic radiculopathy, whatever. To me, it's about what what mechanisms they display after testing them. And one of the common questions I get is, can, can you do neuromobilisation for chronic um, CRPS2, which of course used to be called OSD, which makes some sort of dystrophy? And I would say, well, yes, but what's the cause? Um, mm-hmm. And so some people just get a, a disorder of nociception or even central processing changes, or they might have a, a subtle peripheral neuritis or neuropathy, but I'll treat whichever one it is or bump combination. Um, I, I wouldn't be emphasising nerves in relation to that problem generally. But the long-term nerve problems, then it's a different story. We could focus on the specifics for that. Okay, and I think you, you spoke to that really well before. I was addressing the whole person and the numerous factors that are involved in lifestyle, behaviour, smoking, alcohol, diet, all yeah. that sort of stuff that, that goes with yeah. it as well. And, and for me, there's a big move to general, which actually I think is good. But unfortunately, I think sometimes that's at the expense of the specific. Um, and, and so people are leaving the specific, going to general, and philosophically, they just don't care about specific. Now, I think that's okay, but you've got to tell a patient, we don't care about specifics, we only do general here, you want specifics, you should be able to go somewhere else because some people do need specific treatment. And, and so that's come a bit political and philosophical, but I feel if we, if, we, if we go to one end of the spectrum, we are reducing our choice and our patient's choice. So I prefer to have a broad range of skills and be apply, willing to apply the right skills for the right patient. That's perfect. Individualised look at it all um, and treat the person in front of you. Sometimes you can jokingly say to the patient, you're the same as everyone else because you're unique. <laughs> I love that. Uh, well, fantastic, Michael. We might leave it there. Uh, thank you so much for your time and sharing your wealth of knowledge. Uh, I know I got a lot out of it and I'm sure our listeners will too. Um, do, where can people find out a little bit more about you? Oh, okay. NeurodynamicSolutions.com is our website. We also have an Instagram uh, site called Neurodynamic Solutions. We used to have Neurodynamics, but it got stolen, uh, and we're now mostly operating operating on uh, Neurodynamic Solutions Instagram, Facebook as well, and, and NeurodynamicSolutions.com. We do online stuff and everything there. You can have a look, a look at what's available. Fantastic. So I highly recommend Michael's work. I highly recommend his his book, Clinical Neurodynamics. Um, if you've got any more questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, and thank you so much once again, Michael. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Cheers.